owners of the unceded oh, <laughs> got it on the unceded land on which I'm on um the, the Wandering we were wrong and Boone were wrong of the Kulin Nation and pay my respects to elders past and present and their families and I'd also like to acknowledge and pay my respect to the people on the, of the lands on which you you're all zooming in from today um so Thank you all for coming. It's great to see you all here. Um, some former DOC students, um, members of SIC and, and the Citroen Network. Um, so today you'll, you'll get to hear from four of the five um, students who are part of the DOC group this year. Um, and they completed their research project as part of their honours in psychology. Um, yeah, thesis project. So the Dynamics of Community Research Collaborative um, it seeks to support research and writing that considers the way in which people and communities function. And there's a particular focus on the context in which people and communities exist. So the social, political, cultural, organizational contexts. Um, the collaborative seeks to understand power relations that shape individual and group identities, intergroup relations and subjectivities. And we draw on critical cultural and community psychology um, theories and approaches employing qualitative and creative methods to co-construct nuanced insights from the experiences of individual and groups who are displaced because of change processes or marginalized and excluded through structural violence. Um, this group, though under a different name, it first began many years ago, um, initiated by Chris Son um, and involving a number of people who are here today. And I first, um, became part of this group as a PhD student um, with other PhD students. And it was a place for us to connect, share and discuss our research, given our um, shared interests as part of the um, Community Identity Displacement Research Network. Um, the group has involved staff, including PhD students, so Rama, Rashani, Sam, though now it's Dr. Sam, um, and students from psychology, so honours, community psychology and masters, as well as PhD students um, with relevant projects. So the research projects of the 2021 um, Dynamics of Community Group um, engage a range of qualitative methodologies, narrative discourse and photo elicitation approaches to examine identity making, belonging, the formation of intercultural solidarities, community making, and a troubling of taken for granted categories and context, context within the Australian context. Um, so we'll have four presentations. Um, so we have Alev presenting on the experience of racialized allies working in solidarity with indigenous people. Alem will be talking about the psychologization of youth unemployment in Australia. Annabelle um, querying femininities in people of colour through photo elicitation and narrative inquiry. And Iklil will be coming to present on um, exploring identity and belonging for second generation invisible Muslim Australians. Um, unfortunately, Meron wasn't able to join us today, but she did a great project exploring um, migrants from the Ethiopian diaspora narrating uh, um, resilience in their everyday life. So we, our first speaker will be Alev, um, and we will leave the questions or comments till the end, and we'll have some time for some discussion, but feel free to pop any comments or questions in the chat um, as they're speaking. Thank you, Amy. Let share my screen. Awesome, thank you. All right, so I began today by acknowledging the Woiwurrung and Gunwurrung people of the Kulin Nations, the traditional custodians of the land on which I'm currently on, and pay my respects to their elders past and present. I extend that respect to Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples here today. So my name is Alev and I'll be discussing my thesis titled The Experiences of Racialized Allies, Working in Solidarity with Indigenous People. So to begin, I will establish the historical context preceding the content of the paper, which commenced with the arrival of the British ships onto Gadigal country in 1788. Despite the high population of Indigenous peoples across the many countries, the British invaders falsely declared the lands to be terra nullius or belonging to no one. Following their arrival, the British invaders committed massacres and genocides against the Indigenous nations through organised attacks and biological warfare, 
uh, and continued their oppressive regime with forced relocation and assimilation, further contributing to the loss of cultures and languages. Australia was founded on white supremacy and Eurocentrism with the racial hierarchy strongly impacting all that entered the country. The racial hierarchy was fabricated by the dominant white group through the process of racialization, which Omi and Wenat defined as the extension of racial meaning to a previously racially unclassified relationship, social practice or group. This sought to other all non-white people creating a binary mentality of us versus them. These ideologies were further reflected in the migration policy with the passing of the Immigration Act of 1901, which saw the end of non-European migration and became the basis of the white Australian policy. This cemented the concept of whiteness as a central component of the Australian political, social, cultural and historical landscape. After decades of a white Australia, the policy came to an end in 1973 and the country pursued a multicultural approach. However, this was not without controversy. Criticisms against multiculturalism was present across the political spectrum. Racism continues to be prevalent today with Indigenous people, people who speak a language other than English, and people born outside of Australia experiencing the highest levels of racism, both on an individual level and a systemic level. As attempts to address racism and inequality increase amongst mainstream spaces, the concept of an ally has become more prevalent. Williams and Sharif define allies as people who recognize the unearned privilege they receive from society's patterns of injustice and take action to change it. Allyship, however, has received numerous criticisms, issues over who earns the term ally, who assigns the term, the time frame of the term, and the appropriate context for the term have been raised. Further concerns have been raised that the term ally falsely elicits a static identity, which creates the notion of an end goal that can be achieved rather than acknowledging an ongoing process. Phrases such as working in solidarity or reflexive anti-racism have been established to counteract these concerns. The need to interrogate the motivations behind allyship have been highlighted. As social justice issues gain widespread acceptance, symbolic acts of allyship, particularly on virtual spaces, are rampant. However, these acts are rarely followed with real action, nor the extensive reflexive process required to work in solidarity with an oppressed community. This performative allyship merely serves selfish desires to appear as good. Unexamined altruistic motivations may lead to white saviorism, which ultimately upholds the power imbalance by positioning white people as the benefactors who assist racialized groups without acknowledging the history or systems that cause inequality. Further criticisms have been made regarding the assumption that allyship solely involves white people, as this false belief further advances the narrative that whiteness equates to goodness. Therefore, decolonization is vital in the work of solidarity and allyship. Decolonization is a process of unlearning and altering the current systems, structures and values of society that are deeply embedded with colonial and Western frameworks and ideas. A decolonized approach challenges the status quo of white dominance and requires that solidarity replaces the savior narrative with a mutual goal to end systems of oppression. In the words of Patel, the oppressed cannot be liberated by the oppressor. Discourse surrounding allyship within the sphere of racial inequality often frames the conversation into a binary of black and white, further marginalizing and other ethnic experiences of racialized people. This study attempted to contribute nuance to the conversation by decentering whiteness and focusing on solidarity across minority groups. A qualitative approach was undertaken involving semi-structured interviews with seven participants who are self-identified as racialized and who have a professional and personal commitment to anti-racism, particularly in relation to indigenous self-determination. The data analysis was informed by Braun and Clark's reflexive thematic analysis approach, which uncovered two main themes. The first main theme was bureaucracy as a mechanism of oppression, which encompassed two sub-themes, white gatekeeping and the commodification of wokeness. The sub-theme of white gatekeeping encapsulates the limiting and repressive nature of working in solidarity that is perpetuated through institutions. The participants reflected that despite the knowledge Indigenous people have of their needs of their country and community, they are continually restricted from accessing positions of power, which are consistently occupied by white Australians. This was often attributed to positions of power requiring certain qualifications. However, participants scrutinized this premise by recognizing the multitude of barriers Indigenous people face and further acknowledge that Indigenous people may not have the desire to pursue qualifications in the Western sense. The participants further examined the need for ongoing involvement from external agencies or middlemen in order to implement their objectives and how this conflicts with the fundamental right of Indigenous sovereignty. A significant challenge reported by the participants was the limited access to finances and resources. Oftentimes this challenge was able to be combated through communities banding together in support or accessing funding through organizations. The latter method subsequently created further challenges as funding through organizations was often conditional and required the desires of the organization to be prioritized. 
the participants critiqued the harmful policies imposed by institutions that neglected to consider the wants or needs of their Indigenous clients, nor the emotional or psychological implications of their policies, rather the policies opted to satisfy the demands of the organisation. These paternalistic frameworks reinforce the false colonial narrative that Indigenous people are incapable of self-governance, while further neglecting to acknowledge the impact of colonisation on structural inequalities. The participants further shared the negative repercussions they face when attempting to speak out against the harmful policies and practices of the institutions, including the termination of their employment. The second sub-theme is the commodification of workness, which encapsulates the co-option of allyship from a means of providing support to marginalised communities to an instrument utilised to enhance social positioning of individuals and organisations. The popularisation of social justice issues amongst mainstream society was beneficial in raising public awareness and support. However, this created the dy dynamic in which proximity to marginalised communities could be valuable to individuals and organisations. While this may appear progressive, the support provided by individuals and organisations that occupy a position of privilege can often be a superficial act motivated by a desire to increase social capital and ultimately fails to address the needs of marginalised communities. Through the participants' experience of working with Indigenous people, they encountered various forms of performative allyship, rendering the participants sceptical and cautious when offered support by certain individuals or organisations. The second main theme identified was named being accomplices in solidarity and captures how participants articulate what it means to work in solidarity with Indigenous people. people sorry. The language of allyship and ally was criticised by the participants, fearing the terminology had been co-opted by mainstream society. Rather, the participants preferred the language of accomplice, solidarity or collaborator. The first sub-theme is connections through shared experiences, which highlights the connections that were cultivated between the participants and Indigenous people through shared experiences. Throughout the narrations, it was clear there was a level of relatability and connection that the participants felt towards Indigenous people based on their lived experience as racialized people in Australia. Connections were made through the commonalities in the histories of their native countries, which often involve colonialism, and through their physicalities of either being dark-skinned and experiencing um, uh, and sharing experiences of anti-Blackness, or of being light-skinned or mixed background while belonging to and identifying with Black communities. The participants share that due to similarities in cultures, values and experiences, they were further able to connect with Indigenous peoples in ways that were inaccessible with white Australians. The second sub-theme was titled Leveraging Their Privileges and highlights the participants' acknowledgements and critical reflections on their positionalities as beneficiaries of colonialism who could use their access to privileges to work in solidarity with Indigenous people. Despite the cultivation of connections through shared experiences, the participants were cognizant of the privileges they received due to their settler statuses, which often created internal and external complexities. Despite the guilt the participants felt regarding their positions as beneficiaries of colonialism, they recognized the necessity to act. Additionally, several of the participants acknowledged their privileges as second generation immigrants raised during the multiculturalism era of Australia. The privileges of access to education and information, the ability to retain their native cultures and access to established familial or community connections and resources empower the participants to act in ways that were inaccessible to the generation preceding them. The, the third sub-theme is decolonizing the mind through self-education and re-education and speaks to the need to engage with a decolonial perspective through ongoing self-education. As articulated by the participants, Indigenous history is rarely or inadequately taught within formal educational institutions. The participants discuss the necessity to engage in decolonized self-education due to the distorted teachings imposed from the Western perspective, which contributed to occurrences of inter internalized racism that the participants needed to address. The failings, of institutional, uh, the failings of educational institutions contribute to the continuation of colonial values. Education from a decolonized perspective further produced valuable knowledge for the participants and working solidarity as they were able to depart from approaches practiced within Western organizations and engage in solidarity from a perspective that, it, that is more suitable within Indigenous communities. The participants discussed their experiences working with Indigenous organisations and highlighted that the governance model was less hierarchical and that the sharing of information and resources was more common than when working within Western organisations. The exclusion and misrepresentation of indigeneity within, within institutions can be understood through the concept of epistemic violence, which is the violence exerted against or through knowledge that works to legitimise and enshrine those practices of domination. The fourth sub-theme was titled The Expansive Nature of Solidarity, which explores the ways in which the work of solidarity expands across all aspects of life rather than existing purely as a profession. 
The participants discussed the strong need they felt to work in solidarity as the work aligned with their personal values and advised that once they began the work, they were unable to envision a life without it. Due to the personal connections the participants cultivated with Indigenous people, they advised that the work no longer felt like work, but rather saw it as helping a friend. The participants also shared the negative aspects of the expansive nature of solidarity, citing a need for boundaries and support systems to manage their mental health. Specifically, the participants shared the need for support systems to be found outside of the communities they support, rather than contribute additional and avoidable stress. The present study aimed to explore the experiences of racialized accomplices and their perspectives of working in solidarity with Indigenous people. Based upon the narrations, it was clear that the participants shared sentiments of dedication and responsibility in their roles as accomplices. As the Indigenous people are a numerical minority within the Australian population, it is imperative to understand how differently racialized people are navigating solidarity work in order to understand how it could be supported and to further enhance and encourage solidarity across minority groups. Working in solidarity as an accomplice is an ongoing and arduous process of learning and unlearning that requires constant critical re reflexivity. The process may be difficult, however, it is a necessary and worthwhile endeavor. Thank you. Thank you, Ella. That was excellent. Very well done. Beautiful slides as well. Um, and a great project. Um, so our next presenter is Alam Jerson. So she's presenting on the psychologization of youth unemployment in Australia. And she was formerly supervised by Sam Keast, but as part of the DOC group. Over to you, Alam. Are, are you on mute? Sorry, yes, I was. <laughs> Uh, before starting my presentation, like this is uh, the name of the, uh, my study, um, I would like to share one photo from um, a debate between Foucault and Chomsky. Um, if you haven't seen it, like I highly recommend it. It's, it's, it's not only the content, the way that the philosopher, the thinkers like formalize uh, their argument is all interesting, but also the, the uh, the way that it filmed is interesting and it has it I think that it filmed in 1971 and this um, debate made me think about the, the divide between um, continental and analytic philosophy, the natural science and social sciences and quantitative and qualitative uh, method. Uh, now my project is um, is a qualitative method um, and I'm grateful for for this opportunity to be you and and also the um, the dynamic of community group and three things happened to, to for me to be able to study to, to pre prepare this present this um, uh, thesis like first Warwick encouraged me to um, to do this uh, to follow my inclination and the Chris uh, also uh, let us um, study the, the topics that we wanted and the Sam was my supervisor like and uh, and his interest uh, is what also like uh, like um was a very important like um the, the is also like um uh, the similar um topic that he studied was also a big chance for me and i think both of them are important the qualitative quantitative but i also would like to um say something that uh, unfortunately the i i believe that the quanti qual quantitative is kind of and this and the natural sciences like dominates when they like come together uh anyway like my uh, now is my presentation if you ask me uh, just one sentence from my study it would be the following. The individualization of the economic and political problem, in my case, is the youth unemployment through a psychological and neoliberal discourse has got devastating consequences for society, communities, and uh, individual. Uh, simply, the problem won't solve, the, won't solve in this way, won't be solved this way, and this only justifies the neoliberal policies and distract us from the real root of the problem and blocks our imagination uh, for alternative perspective and actions and uh, create self-blame and counterintuitive to suggestion which i uh, unfortunately didn't put this into my thesis but uh, uh, this suggestion from me like accepting the constraint is more liberating than the liberation from social constraint accepting ourselves as dependent on society dependent on each other economic and political structure is more freeing 
and makes changes possible at collective level. For example, the health and education and shelter are collective needs, and we've got enough sources uh, for these needs. And the aim of my study was um, to understand how youth unemployment is problematized, psychologized, and the construction of neoliberal form of subjectivity in the foundation for young Australians policy and the research documents. And my study, um, my method was um, Foucauldian informed thematic discourse analysis. And I analyzed 14 um, documents from this well-known NGO. And the, the, my um, thesis, like based on a Foucauldian um, analysis, and for the Foucauldian um, perspective is three, uh, three dimension is important, subject, power, and discourse. And uh, for my uh, project, the important sentence would be uh, the following. The power controls um, or governs us uh, by making us a particular being, um, by particular subject. So we are not talking about, um, the Foucault doesn't also talking about the repressive power. He's talking about more like normalized power and the discourse makes meaning, uh, makes knowledge for us. And when we, and also creates a subject position. When we take up that position, uh, we become, uh, it becomes our uh, identity. And then we start reproducing the um, same power relations and the discourse. Um, discourse analysis focus on this um, taken for granted and concealed meaning in the, the previous, the first uh, slide that this talk between Chomsky and, and um, Foucault, Foucault also says like it's important to unmask uh, this, um, this kind of like hidden meaning so we can um, fight against it. And Parker's um, pointed out that discourse facilitate and limit, enable and constrain what can be said, by whom, when and where. Um, so this was my focus and the neoliberal, um, there is also a neoliberalism and, ne and the, the, the shift, like neoliberal shift was in the background of my thesis and this shift happened um, around 1980s. This is not only economical, economic, but a social and political change we are talking about. The withdrawal uh, of the state from the many welfare um, provision. And the scholars call this the state's new position is therapeutic state, like enabling state, rather than the old version of the state, more like protecting state and provider, but not not anymore. And the the liberation from the social constraint and commitment to the rights and the power of the citizen, and uh, as individual as an individual represents important traits of neoliberal ideologies. And the, and the neoliberal subject now is more competitive and the freedom is most important thing uh, about other values and the, such as quality, equality. And this wasn't always the case. And Foucault also um, says this, this social structure and this, these are uh, subjectivities are all historically contingent. So in, 19, for example, in after the Second World War, like for 30 years, the full employment policy uh, was uh, like applied. And during that time, like for 30 years, like unemployment rate was around just 2%. But this um, type of policies didn't um, live long, like um, since um, 2018, late 1970s, like this changed. And uh, psychological discourse has played a significant role in maintaining the system of power and this power relations and psychological discourse and its widespread influence in Western culture, as in Australia, have been articulated in years by the term therapeutic, uh, term, therapeutic culture, therapeutic governance, therapeutization and the psychologization. And psychologization is the expansion of psychological discourse beyond its disciplinary borders 
and its overflow the area of science, culture, politics, and the subjectivity itself. Like DeVos, DeVos says, like we perceive ourselves through psychological discourse in a reflective way. And the neoliberal subject and the terms around its, um, such as autonomy, um, identity and freedom of choice, individuality and liberty, fulfillment, self-actualization have become central values in many Australian societies. And the constraint people face, if this is like we take up in a position that we are free and and the const when we uh, encounter a constraint, people face when constraint people face become the result of their choices and their responsibilities. The, this compulsory freedom requires us to take responsibility for managing and regulating ourselves. This is also part of neoliberal subjectivity. And um, if we use some um, adjectives, the neoliberal subject is self-reliant, um, resilient, competitive, flexible, self-governed, but at the same time, vulnerable. Vulnerability makes therapeutic discourse possible but uh, also according to my findings, this um, the vulnerability functions in a different way too. Like the collective problems becomes an individual's problems through vulnerability. Like uh, this problem is vulnerability of the young people, for example, this unemployment. And this therapeutic discourse is huge success. That's why the, um, the Rife called this triumphant triumph of therapeutic culture because it offers us salvation healing and 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 happiness health and wealth so it's really difficult and also it's empathic like understand our feelings and it's really difficult to resist this kind of discourse and and to be like uh, critical towards discourse but the danger is um like this this um, the danger is to disable politics um, by transforming this collective into personal problems and make it um, uh, amenable to therapeutic intervention. And my findings, um, um, Foucaultian informed thematic analysis, analysis identified um, three main things, the individual, individualization and psychologization of the problem youth precarity and um, establishing authority. My team suggested the individualization, individualizing of the problem through psychological discourse, positioning young people as precarious, psychologically deficit, so vulnerable, uh, but having a potential to transform as resilient and successful and FAIs uh, as a life coach and therapist and advocator and constructing problem as predetermined. So we can't do anything about unemployment. This is, this is a given thing. And assuming a fair system that having a right skill secure and the secure the good jobs. So, you know, the, and the skills equals to jobs. Like if you have equal to jobs, if you have right skills, then yeah, it's the most important thing is having the right skills. And these two quotations are interesting from my um, uh, thesis. And because I find them interesting because um, it's about, first one is about inequality and second one is about tax reform. So you might expect uh, that the, the, the quotation, the, the text gonna refer to wealth classes or businesses, like some intervention to businesses. Uh, however, like um, it um, conceptualizes inequality as a skilled problem. If you are unskilled worker, so like there is a that's we having inequality because of the unbalance in the skills. Um, and and the other there's tax reform. Is that you might assume that it, the tax might talk about the increasing you know tax uh, from the wealthy classes, but but. It's about only um, the the people like workers. It's about the workers again. So all the intervention towards um, in, in the text was about uh, workers, like um, or people looking for a job. 
And this is uh, the first quote, quote, again, the extract from my study. It's, it's about um, the example. Um, the, this, the person, Tanya, he, she's redundant and, and the, the text suggests that, but luckily, I'm not lucky, sorry. The Tanya is now formalizing her skills and she's studying and she's driving to Uber to support her study. So this is like example, this is what young people should do. And the second one is like Bill Gates um, says, uh, as the world has gone flat, this, so now he, he says like, um, if, if you have the talent, it doesn't matter where you are, you would, if it, you, you would be like, um, it's like there were, he meant like there is no uh, external factors or barriers that affecting people as long as they have skills. So it's like as if we live in a meritocratic, like uh, perfect world, like there is no other um, external fac factors for us. This is the assumption in the, in the documents as well. And um, documents suggest to find a job, having you need to have positive mindset, psychologically strong, highly skilled and adapting lifelong learning. And the targets, the, uh, unfortunately, the, the documents targets only um, uh, serve the market values. And this creates resilient, competitive, and flexible, um, self-reliant, and not demanding workers. And doesn't reflect the genuine and authentic, authentic uh, experience of the workers. And the, what about the implications of this source of constructions? Um, Fryer uh, says, like, the situation as the worst neoliberal violence against unemployed people. And he adds that construction of the unemployed and uh, unemployed, unemployed people and unemployment issues with the help of individualization and psychologization and essentialization of the common economic, uh, politic, common economic and political however preventable issues, like as in 1940s, becomes the problem of unemployed, especially and becomes, an, um, becomes the problem of unemployed people. And as a result, people self-blame, like because they think that this is their fault and this cause um, mental health issues and they feel like they are loser. And the research, my research highlights the importance of the examining taken for granted policy discourse as a site of neoliberal ideology. And this could be a good starting point to imagine new policies and welfare system benefiting all. Thank you. Thank you, Aylin, that was really great. Um, I'm really looking forward to reading it. Um, yeah, showing how people internalize those um, neoliberal discourses and the harms that that can do and how the social sort of absent from policy and things like that a lot of the time. So our next person presenting is Annabelle. Um, her research, her thesis was titled Querying Femininities in People of Colour Through Photo Elicitation and Narrative Inquiry. Let's get this up. You can see that. Yeah. Oops, wrong. Okay. Cool. Um, so good afternoon, everyone. Um, uh, first of all, I would just like to acknowledge the traditional owners and custodians of the land. Um, I'm meeting you on today, the Woi Wurrung and Boon Wurrung people of the Kulin Nations who, you know, cared for this area that I'm in, Footscray, for over 40,000 years. I pay my respects to elders, past, present, and emerging, as well as any Indigenous folk here today. Um, these are stolen lands and sovereignty was never ceded. Um, so my name is Annabelle Gunasakera. Um, you know, I finished my um, honours course this year, ended up creating this thesis. Uh, the title is there called Querying Femininities in People of Colour Through Narrative Inquiry and Photo Elicitation. Um, so I felt really lucky to um, have been so encouraged and supported in exploring uh, my areas of interest from the dynamics of community research group. 
I think um, having, you know, lived the life that I've, I've had and the background that I have, I naturally kind of gravitated toward wanting to learn more about um, systems of oppression and their function, my social worlds and um, how I could utilize this opportunity in university to say something important um, for not only myself, but uh, for my communities. Um, I was particularly interested in patriarchy and hetero homonormativity, heteronormativity and homonormativity, um, structures of our social worlds, um, which have formed problematic hierarchies based on unstable definitions of identity, which work to privilege certain bodies over others, um, including within the margins, such as within the, the queer community. Um, so in my thesis, go to the next slide here. As the name suggests, I aim to queer and query uh, normative understandings of femininity by analyzing the stories of six participants who self-identified as queer people of color with a relationship to femininity. Um, and I say normative understandings of femininity as in the way femininity has become equated with the reproductive, white, respectable, heterosexual approximation to womanhood. Um, femininity is I feel like one of those things, uh, well, at least to me, that just never really made much sense. Um, if you try to explain it, I feel like a lot of people are kind of left out um, who have that kinship to femininity. Um, yeah, and just, you, yeah, just considering especially those bodies um, uh, who op openly and devotedly claim feminine kinship, um, who just do not fit. And ultimately, um, my thesis uh, was kind of arguing the way it has become uh, femininity has become conceptualized by the dominant culture uh, to foster exclusionary and oppressive politics, especially for certain bodies deemed other. Um, so, however, as enacted um, non-normatively and understood outside of masculine-feminine dichotomies, uh, uh, can really form a site of resistance, liberation, and fluidity for a, a, a range of different people, um, which I got to explore. Um, and so, as femme queer people of color, uh, each of my participants stood at uniquely complex, nuanced and individualized intersections of uh, marginalized identities. Um, this was reflected in their starkly different life experiences and memories, which they shared with me in their interviews. Um, however, uh, through their stories, they were uh, able to communicate certain salient messages in common with each other, alluding to social change agendas. Um, so here are just some of the photographs that were shared. Um, uh, participants were invited to bring these photographs to help share stories in, uh, in narrative interviews. This method was chosen in an attempt to redistribute power dynamics to place the participant in more control of what they felt was important to discuss, meanwhile encouraging a listener-teller dynamic as opposed to a traditional interviewer-interviewee dynamic. Um, this actually worked really well for the project. Uh, a lot of participants um, felt, I, I felt this discomfort, they, they kind of communicated this discomfort um, or unconfidence, I guess, in um, their expertise, uh, just due to a lack of um, engagement or prior engagement with research. And uh, I suppose they found it a bit intimidating to be a part of as well. Um, and so from completing this project, I guess, looking back, um, I can just see how the relationship, even just between photo, the photo elicitation component um, where, you know, they're bringing in physical photos um, and the, the people that I interviewed um, being part of a queer generation raised alongside the internet. I think it just worked really well together. Participants were aged between 22 to 26 and many participants um, drew photos from social media, especially to represent and speak on their gender performativity or queerness, um, seeing as the internet has provided a platform for many queer people of color to find space for themselves where they may not have been able to find space um, in, re in, in real life. Um, and so this resulted in uh, the result of this method of interviewing was very rich data filled transcripts, which I only got to present a little slice of in my findings. Um, and this translated to um, a, a, sh a single shared narrative titled Narratives of Contestation, Queer Femininities in People of Color. Um, and so this was divided into um, three parts, high femininities in people of color, um, non-binary femininities and people of color and toward gender expansiveness through queer people of color. Um, so conceptions of femininity 
were fleshed out through participants' stories and revealed the complexities and nuances of femininity as expressed by queer and of color bodies, um, which goes beyond a simple story of subordination, sexualization, objectification, and superficial narcissism as their femininities deviated from that, like I said before, reproductive, white, respectable, heterosexual approximation to womanhood. Um, traditionally constituted by our, our structures and institutions. Um, so their stories reveal the ways femininity is constrained, reproduced and deviated from, as well as their hopes and wishes for the future liberation of gender performativity. Um, and so I'll just go into some key findings um, of each part. Um, so this first part uh, of the shared narrative looked at participants who enjoyed a high feminine gender performativity. And for those of you who aren't, who aren't familiar with that, um, it's uh, essentially just a loud expression of femininity, a very uh, uh, expressive, flamboyant or eccentric or, you know, just, just loud expression of femininity. Um, and I think um, what's important to discuss here um, is how high feminine lesbians and queer women and people are often shunned and casted as illegitimate because their performative, performativity resembles that of a normative heterosexual femininity. Um, and this affects them in many areas of their life, including their membership and belonging in their mutually exclusive communities, that is within the queer community, as well as within, you know, say their cultural communities. Um, or their, their ethnic communities. Um, and so high femininity is scrutinized, especially when enacted on queer and of color bodies um, who may gravitate toward high feminine performance, not only because they enjoy it, but because it may provide a level of protection in belonging to a certain cult, in, to belonging to certain cultural spaces. Um, so for example, uh, this is a photo of Gertrude, um, one of the participants, one of the high feminine participants, um, and she curated this photograph um, and brought it in as uh, like uh, an exercise that she did uh, like art therapy for um, uh, her grief as she was grieving her, her late mother. Um, and she's wearing her mother's sari in it. And she described these photos as quite controversial within her community. Uh, throughout her interview, Gertrude would speak of her resistance to the patriarchal norms of her Muslim community, which policed and oppressed her and other women in her life. Um, I wrote in my findings that what is missed when Gertrude is read as simply an example of heteronormative assimilation, being a queer woman of color um, and the way that she presents her high femininity um, is that within her own cultural matrices, queer included, um, her femininity is further scrutinized and viewed as um, a Western assimilation uh, uh, and cultural dissonance rather than a radical embodiment and action, which pushes the boundaries of what is completely safe, acceptable or respectable for her case. Um, and yeah, just to briefly go over some of the other findings in this part, um, I was also able to present how participants would refuse their femininity to be relative to femaleness, nor sexual attractiveness and availability to men. The ways gender norms and socialization have impacted their current performativity and the ways that they negotiated that. Um, and the tensions that, that came with that um, and how normative femininity was never meant for them to fit in to begin with. Uh, and so through their very being, they are inherently enacting modes of resistance. Um, and so, yeah, I just have this quote here. Uh, Gertrude says, being a woman of color in a Western society where you're not the norm is a lot of hard work. And on top of that, being a queer woman of color, it's just a lot of work. Cutting my hair, for example, you know, women just don't have short hair in Bangladesh. It's actually quite taboo. It really look, it's really looked down upon, especially as an older person. I'm seen as unmarriageable because my short hair and my colored hair and my piercings. I'm seen as quite boyish, but you know, I'm sure to other people, I still look quite feminine. Um, and so going into this next part here, I examined the way non-binary participants would talk about their gender performativity and femininity in ways which blurred and complicated binary structures of identity through their very being and open expression to not prescribing to gender. Um, so I was able to present the way normativity gives non-binary kids a hard time coming to terms with being inherently non-normative, um, seen in childhood reflections and reflections on youth, 
uh, the delays in adversity, those assigned male at birth in particular experience enacting femininity and the queer privilege to have access and um, access to community and resources, um, all kind of highlighting the transitional nature of queer performance and its dependence on unique situational and relational factors. Um, so I just wanted to share with you this quote from Jade, um, one of my non-binary participants. I asked them in their interview if their femininity was different to the femininity that was shared with them originally from um, the, the cisgendered women um, that they referred to as um, kind of introducing them and, and really um, helping them realize their affinity for femininity. Um, and yeah, so they, they were, uh, yeah, so by explaining the difference, they kind of ended up unpacking some real issues with femininity as enacted on those assigned male at birth, um, saying, um, one of the biggest downsides I think is I'm constantly reassuring men that it's okay to talk to me. Like I am constantly reassuring straight men that I'm fine. I can relate to them. I can interact with them. I'm not such a weird thing that it's like, you can't relate. Like we've had similar experiences. You can talk to me as you would talk to any other person. It doesn't matter that I don't prescribe to a particular gender or that I'm quite feminine. Like it's this constant need to reassure those around you that they are safe. They're not challenged, like they're fine. They can treat you as another person. And it's like your whole life of just being like you just convincing people that they can treat you like a person. Um, um, so, Jade's response to the specific querying of their feminine identity is both frustrated and reassuring as if uh, relaying an important message to an audience. Um, they bring to attention the material consequences of diverging from norms through aesthetics, which stand as overt forms of subversion and resistance to structures of normativity. Um, especially in xenophobic spaces, Jade is as if dedicating their whole life, vents the burden of enacting what becomes a bodily activism, which contests normativity and leads to the everyday scrutinization of their character as a person separated from their gender performativity. For better or worse, Jade would say, as they did on three separate occasions in their interview, speaking on the importance of being openly proud of who they are. That's the image I want to be presenting to the world, for better or worse. I need the rest of the world to see this. And so that's where I've taken um, that quote from for the title of that part. Um, so just gonna briefly speak about this third part as well. Um, I wanted to talk about one participant, Christina, who identified as both a non-binary and a woman. Um, actually, when I first asked her about her gender identity, she didn't answer with a label um, like all the other participants did. She actually told me a story about this post that she saw online talking about gender expansiveness, um, which was something that um, I'd actually read used in literature prior to the interview. So I thought that was pretty exciting. Um, but yeah, she had interpreted it differently to how I had seen it used though, um, which was um, almost to gender expansive was uh, kind of used to uh, as an alternative label to replace um, gender non-conforming, the term gender non-conforming. Um, and so anyways, she didn't kind of interpret it that way. She said she thought the term was cool because it was like, we're trying, and I'm, I'm saying this kind of verbatim here, we're trying to expand it. You're trying to get it bigger and bigger. So it's, it's not just like one thing. Um, so they finished by saying that they just want to have range. Um, hence my title for this part. And um, however, uh, later for all intents and purposes, they said, um, yeah, she ident uh, identified with two seemingly contradictory identities, um, although completely justified by her. Um, she spoke about the way being a brown woman has inescapably shaped her, regardless of how non-binary she feels inside, however, also acknowledging the whole, um, and I quote, being a woman ain't real, ain't even real, so. Um, gender expansiveness as defined by Christina is a direction of progress, a movement and a future, and one which has been echoed throughout all participant interviews. Um, participants desire range and uh, that is their freedom to express themselves through their self identities and gender performativity without need for further justification or interpretation. 
uh, they highlighted the instability and inconsistency of many identities, yet pinpointed a value and significance in a re reclamation which goes against the status quo, destabilizing the ways uh, such identities reify oppressive um, politics. Um, and so I guess to uh, wrap up my findings, um, I, I, they really suggest that feminine performativity is not as binary as originally thought of by masculine feminine dichotomies and that participants willful subjectivities and embodiments of queer femininities contribute to deconstructing the instability and inconsistencies of rigid categories such as man woman and straight gay meanwhile realizing the potential of a future in the normalization of gender expanding performance formativities and a progressive and critical consciousness around identity and self-identity. Um, yeah, so as queer scholars have kind of spoken about queer utopias, um, I, I came across the, this idea of striving for queer invisibility, um, which uh, is, is essentially this idea that um, like how heterosexuality or whiteness and all of these other things actually are, are invisible identity constructs. Um, queerness will kind of replace defaults for gender and desire in the public consciousness, resulting in a liberation of bodies and wishes um, and a world where there is less needs for interpretation and justifications of identity. Um, so thank you, that's kind of it. Thank you, Annabelle, that was absolutely amazing. Um, and you can see the richness of the data based on how you approached the data collection, the interviews. You took great care in analysing those stories as well. And, and having the photos makes it even more powerful. Um, very well done. We do have a fourth presenter who doesn't look like they're here. Um, they are busy doing an interview for postgrad psych um, somewhere. So they were hoping to jump on, but they're not here yet. Um, so we thought we might just buy a little bit more time <laughs> waiting for her, waiting for Iqlil to arrive um, to give you some time for questions or comments. And I just want to congratulate all of the presenters. Um, and I think it's really important to emphasize they've done this in block model, this, these research projects and in an honors year. And I think they could all be PhD projects. Um, and yeah, and it's really hard to, they had to, you know, pre present a snapshot of their um, their findings in their their eight thousand word um, thesis, which is now approached as like a journal article, and they're really close to being publishable. Um, so we're going to seek to do that. So yeah, they should be really commended for doing this um, in such a sort of short time frame and and really engaging with really complicated issues. Um, and methodologies as well. And sorry, my my internet's pretty bad, so I probably cut out, out a lot there too. Hopefully not. I'm just looking. I don't think we have any questions other than our oh, Bryce had some questions. Where are they? Are you waiting for questions? I think she yes. is, David. Yes. Am I allowed to ask one? Yes. Go, go, Bryce. Hi. Um, I should have writ uh, written it down because I'll probably muck this up. But um, oh, yeah, oh, they were they were very impressive. All three presenters. Um, lot lot to take away. Lem, um, may maybe it's a comment, but I'd be interested in your thoughts. Last night I saw. The um, Minister for Education, Alan Tudge, on the television um, lying about how they've given the university sector every support um, and so forth. And so his message to students, both local and international, was um, if you feel your institution isn't providing to you what they you paid for, and I, I'm assuming he's talking about um, on campus experience, on campus learning, um, shop around, um, challenge them, take your business elsewhere, which sort of, I'm assuming, um, 
touches on your point about making the the person responsible for their um, uh, making themselves job ready employability. But it's just struck me listening to Tudge um, say that when clearly doesn't take into account the finite resources of students, the power imbalances, but it just listening to you, it struck me again at putting all the onus um, back on back on the young people. What, what would you say to that? Yeah, I, I agree with you. It's like all, in, in, I think these discourses in, in we can find in many, many places, like it's all, it's all about us now, like, and, and we don't really externalize the problems, like we don't really see the situations in education or, or unemployment or welfare system, we all take all things, especially young people nowadays, like, um, I think they, they explain their experiences with their, um, like, personal terms, like, oh, I am on this is, um, I, I, I made the wrong choice, like it's these are so big burdens. I so I can even relate with this all mental health problem um, because we have so much burden on our shoulders. I I believe now in in our age, our time. It just seemed to me like the government was putting all the um, all the onus back on the student, and I don't know how many people can just change from one course to the other or one institution to the other or um but pretty much um seemed to me was uh well if you're not happy you can do something about it where well, I'm, I'm not sure that's the case this um can i, can I get on in on this because i i heard a touch um there should be a, a sort of separate program called fudging touching touchy, fudgy, touchy, when he was talking about the, the, he was actually talking about as minister, um, what the, what the feds did to universities in the last three, four years, which was just to simply rip the money from them, uh, which of course, um, most of it hit uh, the humanities, social sciences, and of course would, would prevent or attempt to prevent um, the sort of investigations that we've just seen today, and these, these kinds of combination of psychological, sociological inquiry into, into the way in which uh, these studies um, kind of, I suppose, undermine some of the givenness that these people in Canberra, um, you know, don't, don't really have any, any affection for at all. Um, I, I, uh, I, I'd be interested in doing um, just, just of those three. I'm, I'm sorry we'll get a chance to, to talk about them a bit later on. When, but, I mean, there is a huge um, commonality between these, these uh, inquiries that, that the three, three of you have given. And I, I found it, it really strongly, apart from the fact that I'm a bit of a Foucault freak, um, that there is a... Uh, you know, there is a really strong engagement with, with personhood here. And I, I'm, I'm really interested in maybe checking out through, through, those, through some of those things. And I'm, I'm really so pleased that, that, that the psychologists and, and others have, have joined the Foucault, the Foucault effect. Um, you, know, <laughs> you know, I suppose <laughs> I've made a, a major contribution in my period of time to Victoria University. And, I don't think they'd heard of Foucault before I arrived. Actually, I, I haven't heard much about it either. But, um, <laughs> but I'm not taking any credit, of course, for this. But no, it's re it's been really, really, uh, it's been really interesting stuff uh, so far. Thanks. But, mm. Are there any other questions? Um, I do have Ikhlil's slide, so I could probably summarise. Um, her research a little bit. Maybe just show that quickly, Amy, and then we can go straight into just talking more about yeah everything, anything. Okay. Yeah, she's still not here. No, must Doesn't be a long like interview. <laughs> yeah, um, that's a real bummer. But here we go. So, 
yeah, so students came into the um, dynamics of community group. They were invited to sort of become involved in projects. Can you see the, the slide? Or the, yes. Yes. Um, um, they were invited to explore their own topics within the broader sort of aims of the group. Um, and so what ICLIL was really interested in was looking at um, exploring identity and belonging for second generation, what she called invisible Muslim Australians. So this was based on her own experience um, as someone who's not easily recognisable as, as Muslim. So she was really interested in that. So I think one of the first things she was, she told us she was interested in was thinking about the guilt that invisible Muslims might feel in terms of passing and um, not experiencing Isl Islamophobia in the same way. Um, so yeah, she did a qualitative study um, with using interviews with um, people who self-identified as invisible um, Muslims in Australia. Um, so yeah, really exploring identity and belonging in the current Australian context for them. So um, similar to other work that's been undertaken, undertaken as part of Sidron by Loot, um, a lot of her work on um, negotiating identity and belonging as, as Muslim Australians. Um, and she had a really strong focus in the beginning on, on exploring people's experiences of Islamophobia, but it became less of a focus based on what she found in talking to people. Um, I'll just skip through some of these. So yeah, a strong emphasis throughout her writing was on the diversity of um, Muslims in Australia and the fact that often there's just those hegemonic, those you know singular stories about who Muslims are and what Muslims look like and all of that kind of thing. And they're, they're quite sort of, um, the way they're problematized in the media and things like that. So I guess that's what that image is about. Um, so she's just defining invisible Muslim there um, and just highlighting they might, might not um, experience the same kind of um, discrimination. But yeah, so really interested in exploring what their experiences of identity and belonging are. Um, so these were her participants. So she had six participants. Um, age between 18 to 25 and it was yeah um convenient sampling through her personal uh, networks and people you know and through that as well so mostly people who were from a turkish background um yeah and semi-structured interviews all online because of covid restrictions um so these were some of the themes that she identified so the first multicultural Australia and Muslims and so there was a really strong emphasis in what they shared around I guess comparing past experiences that people Muslims have gone through and the fact that they see it as getting better um, so it's captured in some of those quotes there um, that, that there's more acceptance and things like that um, so really contrasting their own experience with that of their, their those who came before them so their grandparents and parents um, um, uh, the next one was the idea that they're disadvantaged as Muslims and advantaged as invisible Muslims. So this was one of the themes and I forgot to say, but she used um, thematic analysis, like reflexive thematic analysis for analysis. Um, so yeah, throughout what participants shared, they shared experiences of discrimination, mostly based on their name, like if, you know, going for employment, they face challenges and things like that. But other than that, they're not as exposed to um, discrimination because they might not be recognised in the same way. Um, um, and then the other theme was really highlighting identity and belonging for them as how they understood what it is to be an invisible Muslim. So a strong theme was around um, connecting with Islam through culture. Um, so it is a cultural connection rather than the, the religious connection. Um, it, it's just part of being Turkish because a lot of them were Turkish. 
I'm just really skipping through this. Um, the other key, another part was around the fluid identities. Um, so being able to navigate between different worlds. So having different friendship groups and easily being able to, um, to yeah, be in those different sort of worlds. Um, the Aussie friends or the Muslim friends, or they talk about them as the Muslim side or the, the Aussie side. Um, and this one, so I, um, I really, another really strong theme that came out was talking about the sense of the community and belonging that they have in the northern suburbs of Melbourne. So a lot of them were from there. And so they were talking about feeling more comfortable in those um, spaces and um, um, yeah, because there's a strong Muslim community there. And that's the end. So hopefully I've <laughs> given a, a good enough, a bit of like an overview of her work. It's really unfortunate she is not here. She's still not here, no. no. Thanks, thanks Amy. I think that was important to do anyway. It's a bit like David says, the threads across the projects and and the, although we weren't deliberately uh, for Codian because there's other frameworks that looks into, <laughs> into point of power. But I think the, the sort of dynamics and how people navigate those and um, and also just to get some of the complexity that that pushes beyond some of the, the binary ways in which we are we think about self um, culture other and intergroup relations so so we allow students uh, who are the creative energy I think of 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 the group to to imagine the sorts of ways the questions and also the sorts of ways in which they want to as assemble um, their projects um, and address their questions. So, so I know it's probably a lot to ask um, at, at honors level, but as you can see, it's, it's not a lot for these students because they embrace it and end up producing really amazing projects. So, so, so congrats to, to, to the four of them for actually taking this on because it's the first time that we've actually asked them to also present their work in the public space. So I don't know if people have questions or comments for for any of the any of the presenters. Um, Judy says one. Well. Oh, yes. Oh, thanks. Yes. Um, sorry, I just I like my for a period. Um, yeah, thank you for those presentations, everyone. That was lovely, really engaging, and um, yeah, really meaningful, clearly for the presenters, and um, yeah, very useful and insightful. Uh, insights and you know, analysis and knowledge that's been produced from the project. Um, my question, I guess, is, um, you know, it's quite clear that there's a political and a personal commitment to the project. And what was the transformative aspect for you as a researcher? Like, what did you gain? What did you experience? And um, what were, was there um, a learning or deep development that happened through the process of your research? You get that? Yep. I guess I'm asking anybody. But so I'm not so it looks like Annabelle and Elif and Alan was nodding. So maybe they all, they can they can each have a go. Um, I think for me, the greatest part of this year was just learning how to read research and. Um, you know, knowing people are behind research um, and, you know, learning how to, I guess, think about uh, what people say and not take it as a whole truth all the time as well. Um, I think that was really useful because it's not, it's like, I was also interested in reading research that wasn't relative to my, or relevant to my, my um, thesis, but I'm like, oh, I have to read this when I finish, you know, um, but yeah, now I have like this whole skill that um, I can, I can use if, as long as I keep practicing it, I suppose. Um, and then, yeah, I guess it was a, a pretty steep learning curve though. Um, yeah, just um, especially, um, I guess, realizing all the different kinds of research that can, that can be used to assist uh, different parts of your thesis, um, you know, all the different approaches uh, to analysis, um, um, all the different ways to, to read things um, through different frameworks and stuff. 
um, and just all the theory as well, um, contradicting theory um, or yeah, congruent theory and stuff, things that um, aren't, don't traditionally work together, but uh, people have wrote about working together, combining those things, um, thought it was really cool and interesting. Island. <laughs> Um, for me, like um, first time in my life, like I had a support during that I'm doing something like during the project, not the, in the end, like I haven't, I always get feedbacks or, you know, um, some uh, observations, some comments, but it was, I think, completely different experience. I quite enjoyed it. Um, I even think that this could be the way that like education goes, should go this direction. It's, it's very valuable, like, be, like someone knows like ex, ex, someone has some experience and someone knows more than you do and and kind of like um accompany you and support you um and also like um i'm glad that chris also encouraged us the, the group i mean encourage us to um to do what we are into like what we want to study like in, rather than like giving us um uh, topics and but they helped us to make it um like um, a project and um, yeah, I, I think it was very nice experience overall. Yeah, I kind of just second everything that Adam and Annabelle said. Um, it was definitely a very steep learning curve, but very grateful to have everyone in the Dynamics of Community group every week to support us there. Um, I'd also say like the interviewing process I thought was really fun. I think from my first interview, interview from the last one, it was such a big difference between how I was going about things and the, like the rapport building and everything like that. So I really enjoyed that component of it as well, especially because we did so much quant in our undergrad. So that was a fun activity. Thank you for that. Uh, yeah, thank you. Uh, yeah, yeah, for all those insights. Um, yeah, I guess why I asked that, like, you know, some of the things that you, um, I guess your connection to your research um, reminds me of my own connection to my research, my own struggles. And um, and I think, you know, in hindsight, you know, like years later on, to me, it was quite obvious that it was a, a lot to do, you know, the research process wasn't just about knowledge production, but it was also about healing, you know, healing myself through the process of doing the research and developing and thinking and producing knowledge, I guess. So yeah, yeah, I was just, you know, wanting to shed light on that from my experience as well, I guess. Thank you. Um. Can I say something? <laughs> you can. Where's Amy? Where's our chair? <laughs> David, you can say something. I give you permission. <laughs> I'm, I'm still recovering from touch. It's a, sorry, it's just a shock. Um, look, seriously now, the, the um, it, it really is, I think they really are very interesting projects and and it, it, all three of them and I'm sorry that we missed the fourth one but what it, what it um, occurs to me is that this these all of these are similar in a way because <clears throat> apart from them being well psychological um, and and psychology really um, has has come a lot has has really kind of got really really interesting from a sociological point of view in the in the period, I think probably from the book changing the subject to um, to really about uh, subjectivity, focusing and 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 that's where I think the the projects are all in some in some ways dealing with with um, very politically important matters, um, and and I, I've tried to put it put it together as a kind of normalising personhood, or or, or if. Um, uh, it's a, it's it's a uh, it, it's actually a discussion about about personhood and the, and the history of it and I'm I know that there was a, a few references to Foucault and of course he actually did did a lot of work on that area I reckon um, in Aleph for example on, on all of this the decolonizing stuff was about is about subjectivity it's it's about um, 
loss of culture and and that was also mixed in with a with a critique of multiculturalism and Elam um, on the unemployment thing was also um, a very much a history of the present um, you know like how how, how kind of um, unemployment has been psychologized it's it's kind of a, a reduction a, a reduction of the problem to the to the individual unemployed person uh, which of course has got nothing to do with really much it's the, the person that is being affected is 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 the unemployed person but it's certainly got nothing to do with their with their personhood but 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 they're made they're made up in they made something into this by by the way in which that uh, the question of unemployment is politicised or made political. And Annabelle's one on the social construction of personhood was, was straight out of Ian Hacking. I don't know whether any of you have, have looked at Ian Hacking's work, which is Foucauldian, but picking up particularly on, the, on personhood and how personhood is normalised. And, and I, I just think from... from oh, I, I suppose the very strong uh, liberationist uh, aspects of Annabelle's um, work too, which I, I think is, is really refreshing and, and all of it is. I, I think it's, it's really interesting stuff. And, and um, well, anyway, I'm, I'm very happy about it. <laughs> Thank you, David. That was a really good um, taking on the role of discussant and summarising those projects. <laughs> Great. Yeah, they've done an amazing job um, with really complex stuff. Um, and I know during the process, they at times probably wished they'd done a simple uh, <laughs> quantitative study. No, not simple, but, but they've really embraced um, qualitative research and talked about how much they learnt through the process of engaging really deeply with work that's political, like personal as well as, yeah, political and, um, and psychological. And yeah, so it was, they've done a really um, great yep. job at, at that. And I guess, yeah, a lot of it, yeah, a whole lot of different approaches, but I guess they all share that really critical um, psychosocial approach. So really um, bringing the social into the, the, psych the psychological. Yep. So anyone wanna say anything else before we um, end any comments or? You might as well rope some people in for the next the seminar for next time. Um, Amy, like Meg McInnes. <laughs> yeah, Karen Jackson. Um, uh, as in like to be the presenters or is there one organized? No, I think we we'll probably won't be presenting this year again. I think next uh, thing that we have is next thing that we have is a big bust up at the banks, uh, banks of the Yarra <laughs> on, the, on the 17th. Um, so people are more than welcome to get uh, to that. It's it's a public space, <laughs> no entry fee. Um, you 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 have to be fully vaxxed because um, Peter Gill, if he turns up, will be the COVID marshal on the day. <laughs> but I think people might have seen that. So, uh, but uh, share it around. The Sidwin Group is uh, doesn't have any borders. We yeah, everyone <laughs> everyone's well everyone's welcome. Um, and so, yeah, anyway, so I just want, yeah, thank, thank you, Amy. Thank you to all of the, uh, the, the four students who've, who've, who've presented. Um, I think we've had a really good seminar series this, this year, uh, um, one, every, one, one every month. Um, I think the, it is really important to create spaces where, where we can, I, I think, accompany each other, like Alam said, um, and engage with the, the sorts of ideas and I, I guess push the, push the boundaries a little bit. The interdisciplinary aspects of, as David has described for us is, is extremely important. We are interested in the psychological, we're interested in the social, we're interested in the political, we're interested in the cultural. And, and part of what we want to do is figure out how best do we explore those interests. And in the same way, um, people have got questions, burning questions for them that uh, comes from their lived experiences. So how best do we also um, support people to explore that to, to explore those sorts of questions that I, I know lots of people come to psychology having those questions and they get terribly disappointed when they when they get to third year and they still haven't had a chance to to, to look deeply um, 
so we try and do that and, and just create those sorts of spaces because I think that's that's the fun about being able to read and explore things in the university space and then also make a sort of a contribution, especially <clears throat> around topics um, and questions that you don't always see in the journals um, and that doesn't always and the readings and stuff that doesn't always resonate with people. So we try and do that and yeah, push push the boundaries a little bit. And I guess some people talk about like that little comment that I said put in there and the and the, and the reference that David referred to about Enriquez and changing the subject, which really is about uh, another form of epistemic disobedience at that time um, and, and pushing some of the sorts of boundaries. Um, and so we want to do that in our discipline um, because just like anything else, it's constructed by us and our communities and, yeah, and we have to push the boundaries in that. So. So I'm really, really proud of all of these guys who took on that, <laughs> that <laughs> took on that challenge and did really amazing work. And thank you all for coming to, yeah, to hear them speak. Oh, hey. Thank you. And yeah, we're, and we're and Alev is going on to a PhD, and we're hoping the others are also going to um, go down that path as well, pathway as well. Yeah, they've played very hard to get. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Chris. Thanks, Amy. Thank you. Thanks, everybody. Thanks, KJ. <laughs> Thanks, David. Thank you all. Thanks, David. Yeah. See you. Shall we stop recording? Whoever's in this.